Yeah, yeah. Minerva, is this video about you? No, I don't think so. Do you want to kittle off? Hello and welcome to Spencer's Library. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so to see you. Okay? I'm Claudia. And I'm Irvan. And Irvan is my guest spinster today. Woohoo! Are you excited? I am quite, because yes. like I've always wanted to be a spinster. <laughs> so what are we doing today, Irvan? <laughs> oh. We are going to make tea according to how George Orwell likes it, according to his 1946 essay, yes. A Guide on Making Tea, I believe. Is that what it's called? called? I think it's that's what it's called. I got it. No, it's called A Nice Cup of Tea. Right. So in 1946, George Orwell wrote a newspaper article, yeah, it was an, or was it a letter? He, he called it an essay, and I, I think it was to the Evening Standard. Okay, yeah. so he wrote an essay in the Evening Standard about how to make what the, like the perfect cup of tea yeah well in yeah so in we've got everything here hang on do we have where's tea strainer <laughs> <laughs> tea strainer what you can't see is that both cats are watching us very intensely so shall we introduce what we have on here first okay we have fine bits of china yes teapots teacups milk jug wait you can't see the kettle uh, There's an electric kettle over there, very 1946. Yes. And, <laughs> and a bag of tea. And a tea strainer. Yeah. Right, so do you want to read out the article? Right, okay, it starts off with, If you look up tea in the first cookery book that comes to hand, you will probably find that it is unmentioned, or at most you'll find a few lines of sketchy instructions which give no ruling on several of the most important points. This is curious, not only because tea is one of the mainstays of civilization in this country, as well as in Era, Australia and New Zealand, but because the best manner of making it is the subject of violent disputes. Well, <laughs> to live in the 1940s. I know, right? <laughs> what was the civilization that he mentioned? Was it the UK, yeah, Australia? Era is Ireland. Ireland, yeah. the UK, Australia. And New Zealand. And New Zealand. Yes. Basically, yes. in the Anglophone countries. I was just going to say, it's very colonialist, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Tea. I'm sure they've never heard of that in Asia. <laughs> I guess so. Uncivilized. Oh, oh, did you know that tea, that, well, the tea drinking culture was, I believe, was introduced by a Portuguese princess. Yeah, who married into the British royal yes, family, right? she did. And, and she couldn't, uh, she was not used to the meal times here. So uh, she had tea to kind of pad out the meal time so she well, doesn't waste so must long. have had a lot of milk and sugar in mm. that to make that a meal well no i i think it, she would have had cakes oh fair enough <laughs> so that was george Orwell's introduction to tea uh, so um when i look through my own recipe for the perfect cup of tea i find no fewer than 11 outstanding points on perhaps two of them there would be pretty general agreement but at least four others are acutely controversial so here are his 11 rules every one of which a golden. Okay. <laughs> well, he's certainly uh, setting himself up there. Yeah, there we are. So first of all, we should use Indian or Ceylonese tea. Right. Well, we have got <laughs> a German Darjeeling. What does first flush FOP mean? So it's uh, first flush, first orange pecco, which is the tips of the... All right. Tea. Is that yeah. good? That's a good one, yeah. Okay. You've got the top quality. Oh, nice, that. nice. I didn't even know it. So I bought this in a German drugstore. Um, <laughs> nice. And it's loose leaf. Uh, well, I think tea bags were not invented yet at that time. I'm not sure. I don't know. Either. I think they were only used as samples back in the day. Well, he says China tea has virtues which are not to be despised nowadays. It is economical and one can drink it without milk but there is not much stimulation in it one does not feel wiser braver or more optimistic after drinking it anyone who has used that comforting phrase a nice cup of tea invariably means indian tea that's interesting i would say today it's almost the other way around isn't it? <laughs> yes, like I know. indian tea is sort of what you get in the supermarket and chinese tea is what you order from specialist shops online. Yeah, and I, I think it's probably because he did not have access to all the ranges of tea. Didn't George Orwell live and work in India for a while? I think it was Burma. Right, mm. but he may not have been to China. Yeah, that's a very good so, thing to think about. Yeah. Well, secondly, tea should be made in small quantities, that is, in a teapot. Which we have. Yeah. Tea out of an urn is always tasteless, while army tea made in a cauldron tastes of grease and whitewash. 
I can definitely agree to the urn tea. It's it's never a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I I would like to have a cauldron. <laughs> I know. I was actually thinking of buying one on Amazon. <laughs> the teapot should be made of china or earthenware. Well, silver or Britannia ware teapots produce inferior tea, and enamel pots are worse. Though curiously enough, a pewter teapot, although a rarity nowadays, is not so bad. <laughs> Okay, well, we've well, gone we for the gold standard, so... Right. And thirdly, the pot should be warmed beforehand. This is better done by placing it on the hob. Don't do it with this. You will crack the china if you and do. No, 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 but why does he say that you have to use china and then he tells you to put it on the hob? I don't know. Maybe because hobs were different. Fourthly, the tea should be strong. For a pot, pot holding a quart, if you're going to fill it, to, uh, fill it nearly to the brim, six heaped teaspoons would be about right. So we have no idea either what a quart is or how much <laughs> fits in this. So we've decided on five teaspoons, yes, right? Yes, sounds so about the, right. So the teaspoon goes like straight in the pot, yeah? Yeah. Right, do you want to read on what I do? Okay. Um, he says, in a time of rationing, this is not an idea that can be realised on every day of the week, but I maintain that one strong cup of tea is better than 20 weak ones. This was during rationing. I hadn't yeah. thought about that. Yeah. So, so even having a pewter teapot was, was not, you know, it's a bit of yeah. a question for regular people. Yeah, yeah, I do wonder how much tea they actually managed to drink. Looking at that, that's quite a lot. Yeah, so he says, all true tea lovers not only like their tea strong, but like it a little stronger with each year that passes, a fact which is recognised in the extra ration issued to old age pensioners. Ooh. Fifthly, the tea should be put straight into the pot. No strainers, muslin bags or other devices to imprison the tea. Nothing in that? Nope, yeah. In some countries, teapots are fitted with a little dangling basket under the spout to catch the stray leaves which are supposed to be harmful. Actually, one can swallow tea leaves in considerable quantities without ill effect, and if the tea is not loose in the pot, it never infuses properly. Sixthly, one should take the teapot to the kettle and not the other way about. We should actually boil the water. Yeah, we should. Do you want to put the kettle on? <laughs> yeah. Right, we have now turned the kettle on. Oh, why, why is it, it not? It's on, it's on. There's a light. Can you see the light? Oh, oh, yes. okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very loud teapot, I realise. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that the camera's not picking up any of what we're saying. <laughs> okay, I think, yep. Is that right? Can I take it up? Sixthly, one should take the teapot to the kettle and not the other way around. I, I did the wrong way around earlier. Oh, what's the point? <laughs> no, it's, just, just it's gonna... so that it stays hot, you see. The water should be actually boiling at the moment of impact, which means that one should keep it on the flame right, while one pours. put it back on. <laughs> you can do that? Ah. <laughs> Ivan, have you ever seen a kettle before? No, no, because ours doesn't work like this. Okay. Like, none of my kettles work like this, so I'm very, <laughs> very curious. Well, now it's boiling. Quick, yeah. quick, 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 yes. Did you know, in if you're making Chinese tea, you should never, ever let the water... Boiled or rolling boiled. Yeah, people have like yeah, really bit... specific, like, you know, sort of temperatures for tea. Like. Yes, especially green tea because green teas tend to scald. Mm. Yeah. But with this, is fine, yeah? Yeah, that's fine. It's black tea. Some people add that one should only use water that has been freshly brought to the boil, but I have never noticed that it makes any difference. Seventhly, after making the tea, one should stir it, or better, give the pot a good shake. I'm not shaking that. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, stir it. <laughs> and, and put the lid on, right? Yes, you're supposed to let the leaves settle. And while waiting, you can, you can read the step number eight. What's step number eight? Yeah. One should drink out of a good breakfast cup that is cylindrical, um, not the flat, shallow type. The breakfast cup holds more, and with the other kind, one's tea is always half cold before one has well started on it. I wonder, does he mean mugs? Yeah. When he says cylindrical and tall, does he actually, is he oh, talking yes. about a mug? Uh, I mean, mean, we're going to use this because we've got them and they're part <laughs> well, of the set. Well, it, 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 does, it does match, it is mm, a pretty set. It is, isn't it? It was yeah. a wedding present. Nightly, one should pour the cream off the milk before using it for tea. Well, we're buying milk from the supermarkets, <laughs> not from a cow, so <laughs> yeah, it doesn't come with the cream on top, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, tenthly, one should pour the tea into the cup first. This is one of the most controversial points of all. Yes. Indeed, in every family in Britain, there are probably two schools of thought on the subject. 
the milk for school can bring forward some fairly strong arguments, but I maintain that my own argument is unanswerable. This is that by putting the tea in first and stirring as one pours, one can exactly regulate the amount of milk, whereas one is liable to put in too much milk if one does it the other way around. I have read about why why there's a practice of putting milk in first, and it's because the chinaware used to be a bit more fragile about a ah, hundred years ago, and so it will crack to, like, underneath crack the heat of the that tea. That is interesting, but does the milk make that much of a difference? I wonder. Well, I, I suppose it's coldish. Lastly, unless one is drinking it in the Russian style, tea should be drunk without sugar. Um, growing up, my family used to drink it without milk a lot. Yeah. And that's because we use uh, condensed milk for our tea. Ooh, that is like both in one. Yeah. That, I, <laughs> I've never tried that, but I would like to try that at some yeah. point. And in Germany, uh, black tea is usually drunk with sugar and lemon juice. Yes. Well, shall we do that? Yes, right. Okay. So then... Pour the tea in the cup first. Ooh, fancy. This is a lot of tea for two people. It is. It, that looks really dark as well for a Darjeeling, but maybe that's what it's supposed to look like. So there we have it. We have George Orwell's nice cup of tea. Let's see what it's like. Cheers. Oh, do we do this to tea? <laughs> 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 mm. I don't know. Needs more milk. <laughs> it is very strong, isn't it? It is. Mm. Mm. Well, I think it's because the tea is directly infused. So basically, with this method, the tea just stays in there. Every cup's going to be stronger than the last. Yes, but bearing in mind you could just add hot water to kind of dilute it. That's the Turkish style of making tea. Mm, lovely. Um, so we can do that. And I'm definitely going to go and get some honey after this video is done. Sorry, George. No, he just says that if you put sugar in tea, then you're just tasting the sugar. That he... is not true. I don't know. You know, there's there is something in between no sugar and five <laughs> spoons of sugar. He is of the opinion that tea is bitter, like beer. So it is bitter, and like beer, I don't like it without sugar. <laughs> Hang on, no, that that sounded wrong. I don't put sugar in my beer. Yes, actually, I kind of do, right? <laughs> yeah, <mom. laughs> so there's this thing called cola bites. Okay. In German, which is wheat beer uh, and Coke, topped up with Coke, and it's the best thing ever. Right, is there anything else you want to impart on the viewer about tea, since you're a massive tea nerd? Well, well, there's a lot. I could just keep on talking. <laughs> but, you're not, <laughs> but you're not going to. <laughs> I don't know why my brain just stopped. Do you know George Orwell's essay is actually the second treatise in English to be written about tea making. Really? I believe it's the second. Wow. The first is written by Okakura, I believe that's his name. He's Japanese, but he wrote it, um, I want to say it's a monograph, but let's just say it's a very short book on um, setting up the room on how to make tea for Japanese tea ceremonies. Mm -hmm. And he wrote it in English. So if we yeah. thought that George Orwell was fussy. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I actually have the book. But I <laughs> thought there'd be loads more. Um, well, the first people to really write about tea were the Chinese. I mm -hmm. mean, the first treaties of tea was written in the 8th century in the Tang Dynasty by Lu Yu, who wrote Cha Jing, which is the treatise of tea, literally. Have you read it? Yes, and there are 10 chapters, so each one dedicated to something about tea, like getting the best water, the best utensils. So basically, he's compared them. He did his research and has compiled them in this book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, have you tried making tea according to the Japanese and the Chinese, like eighth century Chinese oh, method? Well, uh, I haven't because a lot of the tools that he mentions, uh, well, we just don't have access to them today. And they used to drink tea far differently from what we did. For example, um, tea was boiled together with the water to make a sort of soup. Mm hmm. Mm. Ooh, that would be very strong. Yes, and they would put stuff like ginger and and garlic in it. Mm, no ginger for mm. George Orwell. Nope, no. no. <laughs> but that's how what it was because it used to be like a medicinal concoction. Mm -hmm. you know? So the idea of tea being a sweet thing came like oh, yeah. way later. Oh, very much later. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's this great website uh, about um, pairing books with tea. <gasps> it's called tealiterature.wordpress.com. So, so the website will be linked in the description box. Also linked in the description box will be George Orwell's article and Irvan's own YouTube channel. Um, you do mostly music. 
yeah. Eurovision folk, everything really. <laughs> I well, that's what I like to think I do. <laughs> yes, I'm, it's mostly a music channel that I'm thinking of branching out. Yeah, yeah. go for it. Uh, the article um, talks about the book itself. And why the tea pairs with that book? It's normally because the themes of the book mm-hmm. is a certain way, and the tea tastes like that. That is pretty cool. Mm. It's like a visualization of the flavors. Yeah. All right. Uh, if we've got nothing else, we'll just finish our tea. I'm gonna go and get some honey. <laughs> okay. We still have like most loads of, it. <laughs> of tea. Thank you for watching. You have to say bye. Bye. <laughs>